Yeah, I'm David Ward. I um, have sort of two posts. Um, one is as a lecturer and researcher at the University of Reading in the UK. Um, and I specialize in disorders of fluency. Um, I'm also a clinician and I uh, split that post at Reading with my work for the National Health Service. So that's uh, based in Oxford and I run a specialist fluency clinic there. So I have clinics two days a week and I'm working in Reading doing research and teaching students and the inevitable admin <laughs> um, for the other three days of the week. Um, so I guess just a little bit of background about me. Um, I went into speech and language therapy or speech language pathology, I guess, depending on which part of the world we're, we're coming from. Um, because of a specific interest in fluency. And I don't know quite where that came from. Um, uh, and also an interest in phonetics. And I thought that was maybe one way of combining uh, the t my two interests, kind of why people stammered. I didn't really know very much about cluttering at that point and why, uh, and maybe the, the mechanics of that. So from the phonetic side of things. Uh, since then, my, my interest in terms of the etiology side of disorders of fluency has, have it, has expanded. So into, uh, into neurological um, and um, other parts of the, uh, uh, of the uh, fluency experience or disfluency experience. Um, so I've perhaps maintained an interest longer than some people. I think cluttering has often been regarded as the, I think was it, I can't remember, maybe it was Weiss who, who described it as the orphan of speech and language pathology. Um, that's changing fortunately, but there's still kind of a comparative lack of focus, I think, on cluttering. Um, I guess it's still in the shadow of its big brother. <laughs> That's where my focus has been for the last, oh my goodness, 30 plus years, both on the kind of, on the management um, and, uh, and the research into disorders of fluency and, you know, particularly clustering. I think here's the problem. I think depending on which definition you work by, I either definitely have a clutter or maybe have a clutter. I think under the current definitions, it's a moot point. I'm, I think sometimes I definitely meet the criteria for cluttering. Um, I guess it's whether I meet it enough now. If you'd asked me this question uh, 10, 15 years ago, I would say, yes, I do clutter. But I think there's been a slight shift in kind of how we perceive cluttering so I don't think it's quite my own case is quite as much open and shut as I would have thought it was a few years ago well I mean that's a really interesting point I um but I think the short answer to that is probably Ken St Lewis's work um who had become increasingly concerned that people were applying different definitions of cluttering to the research they had done. This is going I get from Vice onwards. I mean, Vice's book back in 1967, for those who don't know, it's kind of like a monograph on cluttering. Um, is, uh, it's fantastic and full of really interesting ideas, but none of it founded in science. Ken St. Louis and others as well became concerned that there was a lot of speculation and kind of a lot of people deciding what cluttering is without actually having any real kind of scientific basis for making those assertions. Um, and particularly, uh, so I mean, he's working from that kind of scientific perspective. Um, and in the, in the years sort of 2000s onwards, increasingly was refining what he called this lowest common denominator definition of cluttering. Um, which was eventually published um, in 2011, um, along with uh, Katrin Schult. Um, so the idea was, as the lowest common denominator um, thing sat, you know, indicates, uh, he, his, he wanted to distill cluttering down into the, 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 the very nuts and bolts of what it absolutely must be and then treating lots of other things that had previously been regarded as a part of cluttering as peripheral, maybe linked, um, but not actually core cluttering. So I think, and this is where my own cluttering diagnosis or non-diagnosis fits in, the issues that I have are with, I would suggest are with high level language organization, which Vice and earlier researchers 
and some researchers now still believe is a, a central part of cluttering. But Ken St. Lewis's lowest common denominator um, uh, definition had this as outside that. So I'm trying to keep a lid on my speech rate, but my speech rate is naturally much faster than this. And when it goes fast and I have those language breakdowns, which I can repair more easily when I'm going slowly. But that's when I, I think, yes, I probably do meet the criteria for cluttering. And if you were to hear me going fast, I think a lot of people would say, wow, yeah, this is a person who clutters, but I accept that for a lot of the time, maybe I don't come across as that. So maybe that's one area which I think has changed what goes, and that's just the, the whole perception of, of how language fits into the cluttering diagnosis or doesn't fit into it. I think in the past, it's been regarded as a central part by a lot of researchers, at least. Now, that's very much more open to question, I think. Do you know what? I, I don't know. And I think that the reason, I think the problem we have is that we still don't really know what cluttering in essence is. Because I think even for people who have what you might describe as core cluttering, people for whom pretty much everyone would say, yes, I would identify that person as a person who clutters. There's still that variability there. It's where you have that kind of core um, that centrality where you say no this is cluttering and nothing else um so where do i stand i mean i grew up as i said when i first started looking into cluttering the prevailing thinking was that there was language involved in that and there are still researchers who do actually believe you know who, who feel strongly that language component is is a part of it um but that sort of you know that has has fallen away um so i think the problem is that we just don't we still don't have an idea even if we try and distill it down and distill it down and we you know if you look at the lcd the lowest common denomination uh, denominator uh definition i think there are still problems with it because um because some of the the things that are core to that definition really become only activated when they happen to a certain degree. Yes, for, for sure, some people who clutter may be cluttering pretty much all the time, but for the vast majority, it's not there all the time. It sort of comes and goes. Where do you say that that's cluttering and where it's not? And I think this is where cluttering is different from stuttering because you don't have to stutter very often, but those kind of senses of physi physiological in, you know, um, difficulty, sorry, difficulty in moving forward with speech I think are quite different to the types of problems that people who clutter have, which is in some senses, it's the opposite for me. It's almost like it's kind of blur, it's like it's kind of run on stuff, which is just kind of out before you know it. Um, but maybe a lot of people when they're excited, you know, there may be elements of cluttering in so many people's speech. So when does this become a pathology? Um, you know, and I think we don't know that yet. Really good question. Um, yeah, there are. I mean, you can define, you can sort of define moments of cluttering, though, of course, you have to be very careful how you do that. And as I say, you know, people are still defining cluttering in different ways. But, um, but in the end, you're just putting arbitrary points on a continuum. Yes, you can do it. You can decide that, yes, X, X percentage of moments of stuttering, of cluttering, or however you want to kind of define it on a checklist, whether this happens a little, a lot, all the time or whatever, and you can have those scored up. But I think they're, and they may some, you know, those numbers may serve some kind of a purpose. But we, I mean, how do you say that, okay, that 50% um, of clutter, 50% uh, of syllables that might be perceived as being cluttered, that's definitely cluttering or, or is that just kind of on the normal continuum? I mean, for sure, yes, you can say it's off towards cluttering or something is kind of, if it's 100% of cluttering, well, I guess then that is cluttering. But, the, but for most people, it's kind of arbitrary and it's a real problem, I think. And I think when we're trying to publish and we're trying to define cluttering, and one of the things that journal editors and reviewers quite understandably want to know is, well, how do you know this person is cluttering and how do you define it and how do you define improvement? Um, and I think at the moment, that's, those are difficult questions to answer accurately. We can, you know, we, as I say, we can come up with criteria, but who's to say they're the right criteria? Um, 
and with that in mind, I know there are plans underway to uh, with Scott Yarus and Kathy Scaler. Scott are working on revising the Oasis for uh, for populations who clutter, and I think that's going to be much more helpful than some of the stuff that we got out there right now. Um, because it will refer to the clutterer's experience because ultimately that's kind of maybe where the battleground is for cluttering. Yes, the Oasis is one way of uh, capturing the, 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 the experiences and the quality of life that people who stutter have. And so the, this version, which is going to be um, available at some point in the future for people who clutter. I think that's going to be a very, very useful thing um, for people who clutter, rather than focusing on where, whether it's X percentage of cluttering or X minus one percentage of cluttering that we see at assessment, because I think those, those criteria are so open to misinterpretation and, and could be evaluated differently by different clinicians. So inter and intra reliability, I think is gonna be a problem with those kind of measures. I think with something like um, this adaptation of the OASIS, as I say, completely, well, it's gonna be not adapted, it's gonna be a completely new assessment, will be a really useful device, tool to have at assessment so we can really sort of capture what it means to have a clutter rather than trying to get bogged down in the minutiae of, of is it this or is that, cluttering spectrum or is it not cluttering I think while well, at the moment we, we're still fishing around a little bit in the dark as to what exactly cluttering is and exactly what cluttering isn't I think the lowest common denominator holds that let's see if I can remember this kind of offhand it's basically you have to have either at least one of two underlying factors to meet the criteria one is speech that sounds overly rapid doesn't have to be overly rapid when you actually kind of measure it in objective terms, but just sounds too quick for, the, for that person to handle. So that's one of the two. The second is that speech may be jerky and dysrhythmic. So uh, if I can put my, my own sort of cluttering voice on here, it's something like that. And then I'm speaking at this rate, then I do something like that again. And you're thinking, I'm not sure if I quite got those few syllables. So that kind of jerkiness in speech rhythm, that's another factor. So you can either have both of those or one of those, but you have to have at least one of those underlying. In addition, though, that's not cluttering, though. In addition, you have to have at least one of three other things. Um, one is excessive co-articulation over co-articulation. In other words, running sounds together too much. So speech sounds blurred or slurred together. Um, another one is excessive uh, number of normal non-fluences. So ums and ers. Once again, these are the sort of things that everybody does, but so what do we mean by excessive? Um, but that's, where the, that's one of the criteria. And lastly, um, abnormal pausing. So where speech just stops for no apparent reason, not because there's a block, but for reasons which the person may or may not kind of um, be able to figure out why. So just to recap, speech that sounds too fast or too jerky or both, and at least one of either over blurring of syllables and sounds, um, problems with speech rhythm and pausing, or too many normal non-fluences. And that's the lowest common denominator. But actually, if you think about it, I mean, that's not, and you can argue that you could, you could try and go lower, and I'm sure Ken St. Louis and Katrin Schultz would have liked to have done that. But that's kind of um, out of the small group of people that they did their analysis on. These were the factors that, that, that came down to that kind of distilled model. But going back to the language thing, um, my question is, and I agree about the excessive number of normal non-fluences. So I think that's probably where I, my cluttering diagnosis would be. When I'm going too fast, I'll be going too fast. But by and large, the problem is I've got those abnormal, uh, well, I've got a few kind of abnormal pauses, but mostly it's those ums and ers because, well, there it is. Because what? I would suggest that my ums and ers are very much linked to slowness in language processing, basically, to put it sort of 
pretty crudely. I need that extra time just to figure out how the syntax is going to work. And when I go too fast, that just doesn't happen. Um, so to me, that could be a potential language issue creeping into even that core definition, that the LCD definition, which in theory does away with the idea of language issues being core to cluttering. So that's, you know, that's what I mean by, I think we kind of got this kind of ephemeral thing, even when we're trying to distill cluttering down into the very, very simple um, components, there are always these kind of tentacles which kind of go out into these other areas and, the, and those areas of grayness, are they cluttering? Are they kind of associated with cluttering and so on and so forth? I, I think we're not really there on what exactly these absolute core and nothing else behaviors are. It, it may be that the, they just aren't there, you know? Yeah, that's a really good problem and people, a uh, really good point. And a problem that people have been struggling with, I think for many decades, is this whole thing that cluttering so often doesn't occur in isolation. There's other stuff going on in some way, shape or form. Um, and I would say in my clinical and research experience, you know, by far the majority of people who I see who, who meet the criteria for cluttering have got something else going on. Uh, it may be dyspraxia, it may be dyslexia. There seems to be some really interesting links there. Um, but right across the board, auditory processing, uh, autism spectrum, Kathy Scaler Scott's done a lot of work in that area. And there seem to be higher than you'd expect levels of cluttering in that population. Same thing in Down syndrome as well. Once again, the numbers aren't clear on this, um, but just in terms of clinical uh, you know, perceptions and those of others who are working in this area. Yeah, there's, there's so much of the time there seems to be something else going on. Um, and this is one of the, the issues that I have. Um, I have this model, which I, um, I suggested in uh, my book in 2017 that a lot of cluttering could be explained. A lot of what would meet the, the, the criteria, even the LCD criteria, could be explained by someone who just has maybe a naturally fast speech rate but doesn't clutter. But then that naturally fast speech rate is acted upon by some other variable. Um, so I think one really good example of this is Parkinson's disease. Um, I see quite a lot of people who a Parkinson's who absolutely meet the criteria for cluttering. So when they've got that, that loss of a peripheral motor control, so they've got that kind of slurred, blurred speech, if you like. And one of the things that can also happen with Parkinson's is you get that kind of festinant speech, as they call it. So speech which starts off slow and then slowly accelerates as a part of the kind of, uh, what well, the specific things can happen with clutter with, with, with Parkinson's. At that point, they absolutely meet the, um, the, the criteria for cluttering. So are they clutterers? Well, in one sense, yes, because they meet the criteria. But is that the real problem? Well, no, it's not because there's something else underlying it. And I think that's just one example. I think we can make similar sort of parallels with developmental disorders as well.